All right, hi everybody. I think a lot of you know me. If you don't know me, my name is Adam Dara. I work for Tango, which is weird to say. Uh, previously Moby. So today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you all a summary of a book that I read. It's called Hooks, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Um, I'm not good at pronouncing this name. I think it's, uh, it's by Nir Ayal, I think. Uh, this book was given to me by a friend of mine um, about five years ago, and I've been reading it for four years, and it's taken me a long time. I'm not a fast reader. <laughs> uh, but basically, what I'm going to talk today is, what is a habit? What are the surrounding questions associated with using habits to a business advantage? Uh, we'll, just, we'll talk about something from the book called the Hook Model, and then finally, there's an app on iOS called Make It Rain. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to apply the concepts from this book to that app. So to get started, what is a habit? A habit is defined as behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. Um, so some examples for myself would be, and I do this hundreds of times every day, whenever I need to know anything, basically all I do, command T in Chrome, start typing, hit enter. Um, automatically, you do a Google search, and now you know about whatever it is you were, you were trying to figure out. This is a huge competitive advantage, obviously, for Google. Um, if you think about it, there's a lot of search engines, Bing, DuckDuckGo. Um, sure, there's more, but um, Google's results, you know, a lot of people say it's better. It might be neglig negligibly better, that's true. But the real advantage is that um, people's behavior is just it's just people's behavior is default. You just assume you're just going to Google things, and that's a huge advantage. Um, another advantage, similar, would be another example would be the QWERTY keyboard. So the QWERTY keyboard was developed in 1932, and it was a keyboard layout that was made for a very specific reason. It was made because um, it was basically made to prevent jamming. Um, the highest used keys were spaced farthest apart, and typewriters had a problem where they would jam, and so this was designed for that reason. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's from 1870s. Then in 1932, there's a new keyboard layout called the Forac um, that was designed for people. Um, it was designed with, uh, it was designed for, for speed and accuracy, and it was optimized for people. However, um, even today, the QWERTY keyboard is still what everybody uses, and if you think about it, that's because um, the people, if you have to switch to Dvorak, you're gonna have to basically relearn how to type, and it's not worth it to people to do that. So what the book says is that if you are designing a new product, your product needs to be a magnitude better than anything existing in order for people to actually take that time to, to learn it. Another example for myself is Reddit. Um, I use Reddit way too much. Um, a few years ago, there was a comic on Reddit. It was posted on Reddit. I, I read it. I tried to find it, and I couldn't. But basically, um, it was a, it was this guy who's thinking, I spend way too much, on, much time on Reddit. Um, I should go do something else. So he closes the tab, opens a new tab, and then immediately just starts typing Reddit without even thinking about it. And I've done that so many times. But this kind of brings me to another point. Um, and that point is, what is a habit versus addiction? Uh, designing a habit-forming product is a form of manipulation. So um, when we talk about the hook model, you should think about if you use this model basically for good. Uh, you, want to, you want to design healthy habits that are gonna benefit the user. Um, so for example, an example of a healthy habit would be something like taking your daily vitamin. Um, an example of a, an unhealthy addiction might be something like World of Warcraft if you're, if you're addicted to World of Warcraft and you can't think about anything else. So here's the hook model. We'll talk about each one of these pieces individually, but it's, it's basically the first thing is a trigger, um, what brings people into the app. The second thing is action, um, what's something that the user does in anticipation of a reward. The third thing, variable reward, predictable feedback loops don't create a craving. And then the fourth thing is investment. Um, what is the user gonna do that's gonna bring them back through this hook model again and again? So through consecutive hook cycles, successful products reach their ultimate goal of unprompted user engagement, bringing users back repeatedly without depending on costly advertising or aggressive marketing. That's ultimately the goal. So the first thing, trigger. Um, there's two type of triggers. External trigger, triggers are tangible, 
and they're probably the first interaction that somebody's gonna have with your product or your application. This would be something as simple as your friend told you about a product. That is an external trigger that is the reason that you go to the product. The second thing um, that I think is far more interesting is internal triggers. Um, so this is when a product becomes tightly coupled with emotional or pre-existing routines uh, or routing for your users. Um, and internal triggers are often associated with negative emotions. So one of the examples the book explores is, is they interview an Instagram user and the, the, that Instagram user says, I don't have a problem or anything, I just use it whenever I see something cool. I feel the need to grab it before it's gone. Um, and so it's a little bit, you have to think about this a little bit abstract, but um, what that user is feeling is fear. They're, they, they're, they, they're, they're afraid that they're gonna miss that moment forever. Um, and I know that's intangible, but, um, and the cool thing about Instagram is every time that you take, every time that user takes that picture and captures that moment, it acts as an external trigger that other people, that bring other people into the app. Um, so it's a really great system. So I know an internal trigger for myself happens whenever I'm in the elevator. So I'm standing in the elevator by myself and then um, somebody else walks in the elevator and then I'm kind of an anxious person and what I'll do is, without even thinking about it, I'll, I'll just take my phone out of my pocket and just start looking at it. I won't even do anything, right? But I'm just like, that's just my response because I just get anxious and it makes me feel better if I can just look at something. Okay, so the second thing is action. Doing an action must be easier than thinking. Uh, remember a habit is behavior done with little or no conscious thought. Um, there's many theories about what drive human behavior, um, but the, the one that's used in this book is uh, proposed by Dr. B.J. Fogg. So he says there's three ingredients required to initiate any and all behavior. The first thing is that the user must have sufficient motivation. The second thing is the user must have, must have the ability to complete the desired action. And the third thing is a trigger must be present to initiate that action. So an example would be a phone call. Um, so if, if my phone was, uh, so think about reasons that you might miss a call. So if my phone's ringing and it's a telemarketer and it's right there and I know it's ringing, I might not pick up that call because I don't have the, the sufficient motivation. Um, if if um, somebody I really wanna talk to is calling and my phone's right there, but I never hear it, then there's no trigger. I, there's, I couldn't take an action. And then the third thing is, if my phone's ringing, it's somebody I really wanna talk to, but it's in my bag and I can't get to it in time, then I didn't have the ability to complete that action. So it's, it's really only when you have all three of these ingredients and they're all present that a user can take action. One thing that the book talks about that I thought was really interesting is this concept of heuristics. Uh, which are basically tools, they're mental shortcuts designed to help people make decisions, and you can use these to your advantage. So one example that I thought was really interesting um, is this thing called the endowed progress effect, and it's used, um, so one example of the endowed progress effect is for these cards. Um, so in an experiment, basically, um, they gave customers punch cards, and for one group, they gave them all a card like this that had eight slots and none of them were pre-punched. For another group, they gave them cards that had 10 slots, but two of them were already punched out. So for both groups, they, they both had eight to complete before they got something. However, the, the group that started with the two free punches, they had, a high, they had an 82% higher completion rate, even though it's the same thing. Okay, so variable reward. To keep users engaged, you need to deliver on your promises and scratch the user's itch. So this was the most surprising thing about this book to me. Um, but I think in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. So rewards have to be variable in order to be interesting and keep the user craving more. So these things are capsule machines. Um, here in the United States, you've probably seen these like in grocery stores, but in Japan, they're extremely popular. Basically the way that it works is a lot of the time you have like a set of figures, like maybe like five or six figures. And then you put some money in the machine, you turn the dial and then one of them comes out. Uh, so a lot of the motivation for people to do these is that they want the whole set. So you probably get two or three and then you're like, I gotta get the, those last two. You keep going to the machine, you get the same one you already have, you keep going back. Imagine if you just went to the machine, you put in your money, the first five tries you got the entire set. 
well, there's, you know, there's no longer any purpose for you to ever do it again. Um, all that mystery of it is completely gone. So it's hard to imagine, but uh, the same concept can be applied to casino slot machines. So at the, at the casino, most of the time you lose, but sometimes you win. Uh, that's what makes it addictive. If, if you went to the casino every time, and again, hard to imagine, but if you went to the casino every time, you pulled the slot and you just won, and then you pulled the slot and you won, uh, at some point it would, it would feel like work. <laughs> at some point it would, it, would, it would not be addictive anymore uh, because there's no, there's no chance you're not gonna win. So there's three types of rewards. Um, the first thing, it, the first type is reward of the tribe. Social rewards driven by connectedness with other people. An example of this is Stack Overflow. Um, so ask yourself, why do people on Stack Overflow spend all their time answering questions for other people? Um, the reason might be that they're getting points. And then over time, their accounts will show that they've got awards and their profile ends up being their status within the community, and that's a, that's a big driver for people. The second type of reward is reward of the hunt. So this is the need to acquire things, and that's just like kind of fundamentally part of um, the human brain, kind of stemming from the search to acquire food. Um, an example of this might be when you're browsing something like Pinterest, and you're, um, and you're on like one of those infinite scrolls. Um, every time you scroll to the bottom, more things load in, so you're like, I, okay, I'm gonna keep scrolling. A lot of those things that you see are, are kind of boring, they're not interesting, but every once in a while you'll see something, this is really interesting. You click on it and it's, there's just some satisfaction in finding that thing, and then um, it's the same concept. If every single thing that you saw was super interesting, um, it would stop being, it would stop being ad addictive, I guess, or habit forming. And then the third thing is reward of the self. People are driven to conquer obstacles, even if it's just for the satisfaction of doing so. So think about something like a puzzle. Um, there's no other prizes other than the satisfaction of completing it. Even if there's a struggle and frustration from the user, the user is motivated to overcome that and they may even invest hours of their time. Okay, and then the last part of the hook model is investment. Before, the, before users create the mental association that activate their automatic behaviors, they must first invest in the product. This is the idea that the more users invest time and effort in the product, this product or service, the more that they value it. This phase of the hook model is important because you're basically setting up the user for their next pass through that hook model. Um, so there's, there's a lot of examples of this. This can be things like content that the user uploads, um, user behavior data, followers, reputation, skills. Um, one example is Photoshop. So think about a user that's investing a ton of time um, watching tutorials, reading how-to guides. Um, you know, they keep investing in their skill in Photoshop. Over time, they develop expertise, efficiency. Um, this is really important. And then, you know, over time, they achieve um, mastery in, in that software. So imagine if there's another software that does photo editing. Well, that user's not going to likely switch because they know Photoshop which is really important. Um, in the mobility industry, so for, for what Moby does, um, one thing I think is a form of investment is when, when we get a new customer, there's a 45-day onboarding process. And it sounds like a really long time, but it's actually um, the best in the, in the industry. Um, I, know some of, um, I know some of the competitors in past years, it's taken up to two years. Uh, this makes the product really sticky because imagine if you went through a two-year process of onboarding. Well, once you're done, you're not going to turn around and be like, it's time to take the next thing. Last thing is uh, this idea called the IKEA effects. So there's three groups of users. Um, they all make origami and then they're asked to bid on the origami, zero to one dollar. Um, and what they, what this study found was that people are willing to uh, bid on their own origami nearly as much as they would bid on like an expert if an expert had made that origami. Um, this is this is known as the IKEA effects. So when you buy a piece of furniture from IKEA, you put it together yourself, you you value it more. Okay, so we've talked about the hook model. Now I'm going to talk about this app, Make It Rain, the love of money. Um, has anybody played this game? Does anybody know what this is? Andrew, <laughs> couple people. Um, so I got addicted to this game um, three years ago. 
Uh, this was, yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. This is a really stupid game. I'm going to show it to you guys. Uh, <laughs> this is really stupid. All right, so the first thing is triggers. For me, the trigger was somebody showed this to me. I think it was a thing in Moby's office. There was an external trigger. Somebody showed this app to me. I downloaded it. Um, I think one, one example of a trigger from the game is this idea of a vault. Basically, in the game, you have a bank account, and you're just accruing money. Um, well, there's this mechanism called the vault, and at all times, it's filling up. When it's full, you have to go into the app and click it. Otherwise, your vault is full, and it's not accruing money. So every hour, it fills, and it's like, oh, God, like if I don't do it, I'm losing money. So you open the app, you click it, now, now your vault's <laughs> filling again. It's a really great trigger. So action, this is pretty obvious, well maybe not. Um, basically the only action in this app is you swipe up, you make it rain. <laughs> There's a virtual dollar bill and you swipe up and it, and it flies off. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, if anybody was doubting me, this is, uh, one, of, one of my friends caught me, caught me playing this game on, the airplane, on an airplane and Took video of it. This is the actually the, the best strategy that I found. You hold it on both sides and then kind of use your thumbs and you can make it rain as fast as possible. <laughs> Vari variable reward. Um, so new things. I think this is super important for this game. Every time you log into this game, there's new things. There's new rewards. And I think this is what they spend most of their time doing um, because their core mechanic is as polished as it can be. Um, so when I first presented, when I first did this presentation six months ago, this is what I saw when I logged in. Um, it tells you what's new. It's a lot of the time it's just like new rewards. But I've even logged into this app before when it's around Easter time. Everything is branded with like Easter bunnies and and eggs and that kind of stuff. Um, but this is super important because it keeps it fresh. If it was always the same thing every time you went back, um, they would lose a lot of their users. And then um, the, the other thing that is your reward is as you're, as you're accruing money, what you can do is you can spend your money and you can upgrade, upgrade your vault, you can upgrade your swiping. So basically when you start this game, you're just like $1, $2, $3. You swipe for an hour, um, which sounds insane, but uh, <laughs> you swipe for an hour, now you've got like $10,000 and then it's like, I can, go to the, I can go to the thing and buy this upgrade and now every time I swipe, it's $25,000. Like, of course I'm gonna do that. Um, I, can, I can say from personal experience, it's extremely satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> and then investment, I think this is the one part of the, of, of the hook model that this app um, doesn't really do as well as I could, but it's still there. Um, so they have integration with Facebook. So there's a little bit of the reward of the tribe here. If, if all of your friends was playing this app, you can compare your score against those people. For me in the office, everybody was kind of doing this offline. Um, there was one person in the office, and this was when um, Apple Watches first came out. They got the app, and then they were, I would see them walking around the, around the office <laughs> making it rain on their, on their watch. Um, the other the other idea here is like you can actually make an investment in this app with your real money. You can pay and you can buy these things and they end up being upgrades in the game. Again, this is abstract and this is an abstract idea for this app. Um, but if you think about it, if somebody, if another organization were to make this exact same app, it's the exact same everything, you would stay on this one because this is the one that you spent your money on. Okay, so this is. I think this is a cool case study for this, for all of these ideas in this book. Because the action is so simple, there's really nothing besides the habit forming stuff in this game. That's, that's basically what it is. Um, so this game um, is really good at this. When I was doing the research on this, um, I found out, I had no idea, I had no idea this was the case, but this game was released in 2014. A week after it was released, it went viral. It had 1.9 million users who played 30 million sessions. And at that time, they were making $50,000 a day. So that's the true power of making a habit-forming product. Um, so in this, in this presentation, um, we talked about why it's a competitive advantage, the hook model, um, and then we can make it rain. So thanks, guys. Oh, sure. Um, have, you been, or have you been able to apply any of these uh, 
ideas in your, in your work at Tangobi uh, in, in like a more enterprising, I guess, sort of situation? Or do you see opportunity? I definitely see opportunity. I have not gotten to apply these ideas as much as I think I would have liked. Um, I think that my, my own personal role at Tango is more like on the engineering side than product, so I don't, so I guess like I don't really have the opportunity to. Um, I think one example from Brackets for Good, um, which is another thing I'm involved in, um, one example of the way that we've applied it there that I've seen that really makes a difference is, uh, again, that endowed progress effects when people sign into their account on Brackets for Good, um, it's kind of the same thing as like LinkedIn where you see uh, you, your profile is 22% complete and you have a bad rating because of that. And that's a, that's a big motivator for people to go in there and put information in because they want to see that go to 100% green and they want to see that thing go away. And, and yeah, it's, it makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, it, I think it, I think it's a simple thing in concept, but it is difficult to, to apply in practice, but I think it's important stuff that to just be aware of. Any other questions?